Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22? Changed the scripture passage for today. Um, would you, if you could, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. You may have different versions from the Bible that I have, but uh, I'm going to read this in NIV, all right? Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Word of God. Amen. Uh, please bow with me uh, for a word of prayer. The Heavenly Father, we come before you. Heavenly Father, as, uh, as the elder has prayed for us, um, we are approaching your throne Dear God, would you come and just cover us up with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, and cleanse us once again so we may be whole, so that you may be able to work in us. Father, would you anoint us uh, with your Holy Spirit, and would you speak to, us, speak to us directly so that we may be able to hear your word? I entrust this time into your hands. Without you, Father, uh, this time is just so meaningless. But I do ask that uh, you would show your face as we seek after your face. In Jesus' precious name we will pray. Amen. As, I as I'm uh, introduced, uh, my name is Daniel Kim. I'm a pastor or reverend or missionary, Daniel Kim. Uh, I don't care how you call me, but just not Daniel Kim because I'm not your friend. Uh, I'm a pastor. I'm a reverend. I'm a missionary. And I think that's probably the best way to uh, remember me. Um, to give you a little background of who I am, I think it's probably better um, to uh, actually, actually start uh, with my self-introduction so that you may be able to uh, uh, see where I'm coming from. Um, I don't know what, what, you, what you see in me, uh, but uh, if I were to briefly introduce myself, um, I should start with this. I am not Korean-American, I'm not Korean-Korean, uh, I am a TCK. Uh, thank uh, those sociologists who came up with this term, uh, TCK, uh, it stands for Third Culture Kid. I am Korean-Japanese-American. I was born in Korea, I lived in Korea until I was 10, and I, lived, uh, I left Korea at age 10 to go to Japan where my father was born and raised. My father is a fourth generation Korean Japanese. So even till now, my father uh, doesn't speak really uh, speak uh, much Korean. He speaks Japanese. I went to Japan at age 10. I lived in Japan uh, for about 10 years. I uh, attended an American school in Japan, uh, elementary school, junior high, and high school. As soon as I graduated, I came to the States. Uh, my first uh, destination was Charleston, South Carolina. As you can tell, I got the little southern twang, um, if you can notice. I spent the first four years down in the, the, the deep south. I went to the Citadel uh, military school. Uh, as soon as I graduated, I uh, went to Chicago for six years. Uh, uh, that's where I did my seminary training, uh, undergrad, under, uh, grad school. I got my MDiv at Trinity. As soon as I graduated, I was ordained as a reverend, and I was commissioned out as a missionary to China. So as you can tell, uh, there's a little bit of everything in me. So there's Korean, there's Japanese, there's American, and uh, there's a little Chinese in me because I was, a, I was commissioned out to China as a missionary. So enough about me. Um, but before I begin, I shall uh, tell you that uh, I don't know how, how well this sermon is going to go because the last five times I've been preaching in Korean. And uh, it's not easy always to, uh, uh, to make a transition into uh, English. Uh, it's not my mind that's not functioning, but it's the tongue that's not working, as you can tell. Uh, it's always the muscle structure that has to 
reconstruct itself to be able to, uh, uh, to accommodate another language. So uh, it might take some time, but bear with me. There's a linguistic warfare that's going on in my head. So let's begin. Um, Jesus is calling his disciples, uh, and that's a passage, of the, that's a passage where uh, we just read. Um, Jesus is calling his disciples, and his disciples responded to that calling, and their lives were changed. Because their lives were changed, their family was changed. They reshaped history. They expanded God's kingdom. They accomplished the desire of God. It's a powerful calling. And not only to disciples, but even to us, Jesus is offering the exact same calling. Come and follow me. If you, do, if you would only respond to that calling, your lives will, your, your lives will, will, will be changed. You're going to be able to expand God's kingdom. And you will also be able to reshape history. It's a powerful calling. So God is asking us, follow me, respond to the calling. And it's your choice to, uh, to respond to the calling today. So I'm going to invite you today to um, listen to uh, this sermon, uh, pay attention to the Word of God. And by the end of the sermon, I want us to really take a little time to make a conscious choice to uh, to follow him, to respond to the calling. So in order for us to uh, really uh, respond to the calling, at least we got to understand what this calling is about. Yeah, we know, you know, being follower of Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. We, 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 we know about that. But I want us to really take some time today um, and dissect that calling. What kind of calling is this? And I want us to really understand what we're getting ourselves into. What is his calling? What does it mean to be a Christian? And by understanding that, I want you to make a conscious and logical decision. I want to follow after Jesus Christ. So four things that make up a calling, that make up the calling. Four things. Number one, the gospel. Number two, the cross. Number three, the promise. And number four, the example. These are the four elements that make up the calling that Jesus Christ offers to his disciples. Okay? Four things, the gospel, the cross, the promise, the example. So number one, please repeat after me, the, uh, the gospel. If you have your Bibles open, don't close until the end of the sermon. Uh, if, you could, if you could look with me to uh, verses 18 through 19, I'm going to preach according to the word of God. I'm not going to talk about something that I, you know, I'm not going to talk about just because, you know, I want to talk about it. I'm not going to exclude anything just because I don't want to talk about it. I will talk about what the Bible intends me, intends for us to understand, okay? This, exact, this is exactly what the Bible uh, is trying to communicate to us. So we're going to go verse by verse, and we're, 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 trying to see, we're going to see what this calling is about. So verses 18 through 19, I'm going to read this. If you could, just follow along. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And in this little passage, there is an element of gospel that we can sense. Um, if you're not really familiar with the time that Jesus, this, this story is taking place, um, you might not find anything interesting going on here. You know, Jesus goes around and he calls his disciples. What's the big deal about it? But if you look at it, there's something really interesting going on here. If, especially if you're uh, familiar with Jesus times, uh, you'll, be, you'll be able to recognize right away there is something really odd that's going on here. And that is this. Back in Jesus times, it was never the case that the teachers would go around and ask his disciples to come and follow them. It's always the disciples going, out, go, going after the teachers and say, Sir, can I follow you? Sir, would you be my teacher? Sir, would you be my master? that's usually the pattern. But here, Jesus breaks that pattern. He's the one who's actually going around and telling his disciples, come and follow me. You come and follow me. You come and follow me. Not you, but you come and follow me. He's selectively choosing his disciples. What does that mean? It's telling us one thing. You know what that is? 
Unless you're called upon, no one can come to Jesus. That's the gospel. Unless you're called upon, no one can come to Jesus. If it's to anything else in this world, through your good efforts, through your good works, through religions or through philosophy, through uh, science, no matter what it is, through different means, you will be able to reach that goal. But when it comes to God and His salvation that He offers, no one can come to God unless you're called upon. That's the gospel message. That's the good news. The good news is that Jesus has called you. The good news is he has, already lived a di- he has already lived the life that you should have lived. He has already died the death that you should have died. That's the good news. You see, there's two kinds of people in this world, two kinds of people. And uh, you're going to think, okay, Christians and non-Christians, but let me uh, actually break that notion that you already have. There are two kinds of people in this world, and this might be able to answer some of the questions that you're struggling with as teenagers who, uh, you know, are conflicting, who have conflicting opinions about church and faith. Um, Two kinds of people. Number one, religious people. Number two, gospel people. Gospel people. Some of you are probably expecting to hear religious people and atheists, but I'm not going to say that. There are two kinds of people, the religious people. Number two, the gospel people. Some of you may think, okay, how about atheists? Let me tell you, the biggest contradiction in this world is atheism. You know why? This is what atheists believe. I don't believe in anything else. I believe in myself. You know what? That's a self-contradiction in itself. I don't believe in anything else. I believe in myself. I don't believe in any God. I am God. That's what it is. Atheism, self-contradiction. But besides that, a lot of atheists actually uh, uh, attack um, Christianity by saying, oh, you guys are so exclusive. You know, how, how come you guys only say that there's only salvation in Jesus Christ? But let me tell you, do you realize that 87% of the world population, world population are at least, you know, are, are the people that at least claim to have some kind of religion. 87% of the world's population claim to have some kind of religion. Only 13% of the people in this world say, I don't believe in anything else. I don't trust in anything else. But those 13%, the minority, is actually pointing fingers at the majority and saying, you guys are so exclusive. Who's exclusive? Atheist is the most arrogant, self-contradicting, self-contradicting idea that, 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 that exists in the world. But besides that, what is a religion? What is a religion? Gathering like this? This is a religious gathering, not a religion. What is a religion, guys? Religion. What's your name? You look scary. You're like, <laughs> what's your name? Uh, you're intimidating. Well, I get scared of little kids, so please don't look at me like, oh, please don't. <laughs> Anyways, what's your name? John? Okay, I'm going to call you John from now on. <laughs> what's your religion, John? What's your religion? Worshiping? That's a religious service or religious ritual. Not a religion. What is a religion? I was so curious. I looked it up in the dictionary. This is how uh, one of the English dictionaries actually defined religion. Religion is dot, dot, dot. Religion is anything or anyone that can help you or that can provide the answer, the big questions of life. Anything or anyone that can help you to answer the big questions of life. What are those big questions? Everybody has these big, big, these, these big questions. What are those big questions? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What's the meaning of my life? What can I do to uh, deal with this emptiness in my heart? Life is just such a void. What can I do to deal with this? I am nobody when I see, in the, see myself in the mirror. What can I do to feel like I'm somebody in this life? Everybody has that sense of big questions in, in their lives, don't we? That's why we want to make names for, names for ourselves. That's why we try to go to that big college. That's the reason why we work so hard to, to, to become someone. Everybody has that, those big questions to life. And religion answers those questions. Religion actually helps you to answer those questions. It's just different. Religions have different masks. For example, there's an organized form of religion. Islam, for example. They worship five times a day. They pray five times a day. 
But by worshiping Islam, this is what they believe. If I worship really, really well, if I live a really, really good life, if I, really, if I serve Allah really, really well, maybe one day I'm going to die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's how they deal with the meaningful, me, meaningless, meaninglessness of life. How about Buddhism? If I live a really good life, if I perform really, really well, maybe one day I'm going to die and I'm going to be reborn as a human. That's how I find meaning in life. See, religions have different faces, but they, they serve the same purpose. It gives meaning to your life. It helps you to deal with the fear of death. It helps you to answer the big questions of life. But besides those organized form of religions, but there is another form of religion, unorganized form of religion. And these are the things that you never imagined to, uh, to, to be a religion. For example, your girlfriend. If I can date a girl like this, maybe I'm somebody. What does that mean? You're using your girlfriend to define who you are. If I can marry a guy like that, maybe my life is not that bad. You know what? You're using that man to escape from the meaninglessness of life. In other words, your husband, your spouse, your money, or your college background, your education, your grades, everything can be a religion if you use those things to deal with who you are. That's a religion. What's your religion, guys? What defines you? What brings joy to your life? What is the reason that helps you to get out of bed every morning? What is that one thing that, that makes you keep on going? That's a religion. So there is no one in this world that lives without committing suicide, without a single religion in their lives. Everybody has a religion. That's the reason why I said there's two kinds of people in this world, religious people, and the second, people, second type of people, who are they? The gospel people. So I traveled to different parts of the world, uh, different parts of, uh, parts of the world, and I, uh, um, I do missions work, right? And uh, I, I have a lot of um, opportunities to uh, uh, encounter different, uh, different uh, people from different, big, different religious backgrounds. And it's really interesting. Everybody has different rituals. They believe in different things, at least on the surface. But everybody functions under the exact same equation. I call them the, uh, the, the equation of religion. I call them the formula of religion. Whether it's Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism or Judaism or Christianity or Catholicism, no matter what it is, or girlfriend and boyfriend, that first, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, for example, different masks, different faces, but every single religion functions under one law. Every single religion in this world, you name it, every single religion in this world operates under one formula. Let me tell you what that is. If you could, please repeat after me. Give and take. Oh, give and take. Come on, New York. Give and take. Give and take. That's the religious formula. How does that apply? If, if I live a good life, I get saved. If I don't live a good life, I get cursed. If I do really, really well, I get blessed. If I don't do well, I'm not blessed. Give and take. Different facades, different faces, different masks, but every single religion functions, operates under this one law, give and take. Let's take uh, Islam, for instance. Those Muslims, they pray five times a day, and every time they pray, there's something that they do. It's a ritual. If you, if you ever uh, meet up with, uh, with a Muslim friend, ask them. Five times a day, they pray, and there's something that they do every time. They look to their right, they look to their left. You know why? This is the Islamic theology. They believe for every human being, there are two angels following them around their entire life. So pretty much five times a day as they pray, um, they're, they're saying hello to their angels. Salam alaikum, alaikum salam. They're, just, uh, they're saying hello. They're saying greetings to those angels that are following them around their entire life. One angel follows them around their entire life. They, they, he records down all the good things you do. The other angel follows you around your entire life, and he records down all the bad things you do. So there's a goody list and there's a naughty list. The day you die, believe it or not, this is exactly what it is. The day you die, they weigh the good things and the bad things that you've done. If you have more good things, you go to heaven. If you have more bad things, you go to hell. That's the Islamic theology. Can you believe that? 
You hear this? Give and take. If you live a good life, you go to heaven. If you live a bad life, you go to hell. It doesn't matter how sophisticated it sounds, but that's what it is. Islam, give and take. How about Buddhism? Wow, this is, Buddhism is so cool. You know, I want to be so Asian. You know, uh, Buddhism, you know, man, it's the way to go, yo. Buddhism, you know, you think it's so sophisticated. But let me tell you, it's the same old thing. Why? This is, this is a Buddhist theology. If you, good, if you live a good life, if you don't hurt other people, if you serve other people, if you give up your life for other people's sake, then if you die and you're going to be reborn as a human. But if you commit murder, if you steal from people, if, you're, if you harm other people, and if you don't live a good life, one day you're going to die, you're going to be born as a cockroach. That's what it is, isn't it? Give and take. If you live a good life, human. If you don't live a good life, cockroach. Give and take. How about your girlfriend? How about your boyfriend? You think your boyfriend is going to stay with you forever? Everything's conditional, guys. Wake up. Did you sing that song? Wake up, wake up. I was, oh. I was falling asleep, but yeah, singing that song, I was like, God, I got to wake up. But wake up, guys. Your boyfriend's not going to stay with you forever. Your girlfriend's not going to stay with you forever. I'm speaking from my personal experience. <laughs> May 1st, 2001. I won't forget, May 1st, 2001. I really hate to share this, but because you guys are so curious. I know you guys are so curious about it, so I'm going to share with you. John, you're curious, right? Okay. <laughs> like I said, I was born in Korea, raised in Korea until I was 10. I moved to Japan uh, and lived in Japan for 10 years. I came to the States for 10 years. So I'm not Korean. I'm not Japanese. I'm not American, but I'm everything. I'm not saying I'm a holy trinity, but I... Uh, there's three people in one. There's Japanese, there's Korean, there's, there's American in me. So, in other words, I was so confused with who I am. I'm not Korean. I'm not fully Japanese. I'm not fully American. Where do I belong? And especially when I was much younger, I was always struggling with language. God, I, you, my life is a mess. My life is a mistake. I can't even speak one language perfectly. My Korean is not perfect. My English is not perfect. My Japanese is not, per not perfect. Where do I belong? I've always struggled with that. But you know what? It's okay. I came to the States, and I, uh, I started to attend the Citadel. It's a school known for its hazing. It's, it's very, uh, there's harsh military training and discipline there. I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know exactly what I was expecting. But I heard, heard it's a good school, uh, well-recognized in the South and throughout the U.S. So I d decided to apply. I got accepted. I entered. My first day, that's when literal hell was unleashed. We called the first week of uh, the school the Hell Week. I entered, just like any military school, they shave your head, and uh, they make you change into uniform, and they make you stand in the uh, position of attention, and we call it bracing. It's an exaggerated form of attention. Just how you stand. And for every freshman, about five upperclassmen come, and they start yelling at you. I've never, seen the, I've never seen them before. They start yelling at you in your face. Yelling at you. And one of the first things that they yelled at me, believe it or not, I'm going to just share, share with you. This is the first thing that they actually uh, yelled at me. I'm not making this up. It's really interesting. I'm, I hate to say this on, on the pulpit, but this is, this is what happened. I was just standing there, and one of the upperclassmen came, and he looked at me, and this is what he said. You dirty chink, go back to your country. Black hair, black-eyed monster, you're not welcome, dear. Go back to your country. If you don't leave voluntarily now, we're going to come and find you every single night in your room. That's how they welcomed me. That's how I started my school. But guess what? They were very faithful in keeping that promise. <laughs> At 3 a.m. in the morning, they would kick the door open and they would come into my room. I would be sleeping on the, on the, sec, uh, on the top bunk of my bed. Um, they would drag me down, make me do push-ups, pull-ups, and the hazing begins. But that's not the, you know, that's not the worst part. There's times in the mess hall that they would try to mess, me, mess around with me. I went through some tough times, but you know, 
but for time's sake, uh, I'm not going to share uh, much about this. But I want to say this. Um, my military school experience was not that bad after all because military school, they actually offer really, really good education. One of the good things that they taught me is how to be a man. In the military schools, they teach you how to talk like a man, how to walk like a man, how to act like a man, how to sit like a man, how to dress like a man. And especially, they teach you how to take a shower like a man. <laughs> I'm not making this up. They teach you man shower. You guys are curious about what man, man shower is, right? I'm going to share with you before and after testimony. Before man shower, in my high school, this is how I used to take shower. Go in. I stay there for about 40 minutes. Shower, and then you shampoo your hair, wash it off, shampoo another layer, wash it off, conditioner, make it sit there for two minutes as you're washing your body, and facial cleansing. You would take forever in shower, you know, you drown in there. Your body so it's like swelling up after all that water. But if you go to military school, this is the first thing they teach you. You stand in front of your shower faucet. You just stand there, right? And in front of every stall, there's upperclassmen watching you. And they do countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. You're done. So when I went there, shampoo and then done. <laughs> so naturally, you would develop um, a way to take shower in that kind of environment. You, 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 we adapt, right? That's how I learned the man shower. This is how you take it. Okay, man shower. There's no time for the soap, body, body wash, raspberry, nice. You know, there's, there's no time for that. Man shower is how you take it. One shampoo, okay, done. You put shampoo on your hair and you're washing it down, you're done. You put a towel around your waist, you walk out, you're done. You survive for four years, graduate, go to seminary. Trinity, the seminary that I attended, uh, is a very conservative seminary. It's that's where a lot of quiet JDSN go. JDSN, you guys are not familiar? Chandu Sanims. <laughs> that's the quiet, like pastors, they're very submissive, very quiet. Those librarian looking pastors go. And uh, I, I went from my military background, shaved head with my Marine Corps t shirt. I drove in in my uh, Jeep Wrangler, top down. First night, I uh, was taking a shower in my, uh, uh, the dorm. I took a shower, the man shower. I put a towel around my waist. I was holding a shampoo bottle, so proudly in my hand. I was walking back to my room. All the pastors and seminarians, they started screaming. Ah! They went back to their rooms. I was wondering what's going on. Later, I found out they were already talking about me. He's a barbarian. Where is he from? <laughs> he doesn't belong here. And I was thinking, you know what? At that moment, I, was, I started to think, you know, where do I belong? I've always dreamt of uh, ending up in seminary. I thought this is the community that I belonged. But you know what? Even here, I found out that I don't belong anymore. I'm not Korean. I'm not Japanese. I'm not American. I'm not, I don't belong to military. I don't belong to seminary. Where do I belong? And I thought I was belonging to my girlfriend. I, had, I was dating a girl at the time. But one day, my girlfriend called. I picked up the phone. Hello? And my girlfriend goes, hi, hi, hi. And I was like, hi, how are you? And my girlfriend goes, we need to talk. Hey, guys, listen up. Take notes. If your girlfriend ever calls you out of the blue and say, we need to talk, don't go. <laughs> Nothing is going to come out. I didn't know. I was so innocent. I said, wait, what's going on? She looked at me. This is what she said. You have no idea who you are. Goodbye. She left. I was so heartbroken, I stayed in my room for about a week. I was crying and crying, but about a week later, knock, knock, I opened the door, it's my best friend. My best friend was standing there, he hugged me. I was in his arms, I was crying, and he was telling me, hey, I heard about it. You know, I'm sorry it took me about a week for me to get here, but hey, here I am, you know, I'm all you know, here for you. And I was in his arms crying, I was so thankful. I said, oh, thank you, it matters that you came. And after crying for about three, four minutes, he looked at me, and uh, this is what he said, but I came with a request that I need to make. And I, at that time, I was so open-minded towards him. I said, you know what? Ask me anything. I'll do anything for you, brother. And this is what he said. Can I date the girl that you broke up with? <laughs> May 1st, 2001. 
There's a reason why I remember that day. You know what? Some love lasts. But, you know, even the closest love to God's love, even love of parents, God actually says in the Bible, you know what? Your parents may leave you, but I will not leave you. Your mother may leave you, but I will never leave you. In other words, every single love, every single form of relationship in this world is not unconditional. They are conditional to a degree. So in other words, everything is give and take. But if we actually base our life on that, when we don't meet the standard, our lives can be shattered. That's the religious people. But there are second type of people. Who are they? The gospel people. What is the gospel, guys? The gospel. The gospel, I would like to define it like this. The gospel is the power to unleash us from the power of the law, the power of the religious equation. Because the, the, the religion actually tells you, live right, perform well, then I will forgive you, then I will send you to heaven, then I will bless you. But the Bible says, the gospel says, you know what? No matter how hard you try, you can't live well. No matter how hard you try, you can't forgive your parents. No matter how hard you try, you can't disentangle yourself from the temptations that you have in this world. No matter how hard you try, you cannot be the good person that you've always dreamt, dreamt to be. We can't. For all have sinned and fall short from the glory of God, but we're justified because of our good works? No, because through the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Together, they have turned aside the one does good, not even one. But Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. He lived a, die, he, he lived a life that we should have lived. That's why we're justified. That's why we're redeemed. That's the gospel. Not because we did the good things to get to God, but because God chose us, because God decided to die for us, because God decided to save us. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's the calling that God is calling us to be. Do you have that gospel message? Or are you just trying to just perform another religion of Christianity? You know, if I live a good life, maybe God's going to send me to heaven. If I give my tithes and offerings, maybe my, uh, my school's going to be guaranteed. That's the reason a lot of non-Christian friends see us and say, you know what? There's no difference between you and that religion out there. Because you guys are just practicing another religion of Christianity, but there's no difference. But guys, you know what? What we have is not a religion. What we have is the gospel. It's the life. It's a life-transforming power of God. Do you have that? Do you see that beauty of the gospel? Because that beauty of the gospel will free us from, uh, from anything in this world. Jesus Christ calls his disciples because no one can come to God unless you're called upon. No one can come to God unless God comes to us. That's the reason why we celebrate Christmas. Christmas, Christmas we, like six months later. But you know what? I love Christmas. You know why? Because the message that Christmas gives is this. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. If it's any other religion in this world, we have to go to God. But if it's Christianity, if it's the gospel, God says, you know what? I come to you because you can't come to me. The gospel. Number two, please repeat after me. The cross. I'm going to read this. Please follow along. Verse 19 through 22. I'm going to talk about the cross, okay? Verse 19 through 22. I'm going to read this. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus calls disciples, and Jesus' disciples actually responds by paying the price to follow after him. So when we become a Christian, when we become the, uh, the follower of Jesus Christ, in other words, by the way, guys, there's no difference between Christian and disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, according to the Bible. We think, we think, when we confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and we open our hearts and we, we want to accept him into our hearts, 
we think we, we're saved, we're Christians. And then many years of uh, going to church, maybe one day, if we're trained well enough, maybe we're going to be a disciple. That's the notion that we have. But according to the Bible, there's no difference. If you're a Christian, you're a disciple. If you're a disciple, you're a follower of Jesus Christ. In other, in other words, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're probably not, saved, not even saved. Guys, I want, I want you to really think about this and take it seriously. Because what it means to be a disciple will be mind-shattering. You know, you thought coming to church is just uh, all, I, all, all you have to do to, to remain as the body of Christ. But you know what? Jesus actually says, you know what? If you really want to be a disciple, if you really want to be saved, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to really accept the gospel message, respond by leaving everything behind and carry the cross, deny yourself, and follow me. There is no easy way around. There is no shortcuts. Once being called, Peter and Andrew, they immediately left their boats and nets, their means to life. Upon being called, John and James, they left their boat and even their own father in the boat and decided to follow after Jesus Christ. And if you look at um, the church history, so many people who actually made a difference in, in history, all they had to do was respond to the calling and actually decide to pay the price to follow after, to, to, to respond to the calling. They pay the price. It's an expensive, it's a costly calling, guys. Many times we think, you know, becoming saved or coming to church has to do with, you know, confessing. You know, people say, oh, please repeat after me. Read this together. Okay. Jesus, read. Okay, Jesus, uh, I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. I open my heart. I open my heart. I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I open my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. And I want to be saved. I want to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And what, what do we say? Oh, you're saved now. Hey, guys, salvation is not a spell. That's Harry Potter. Whoever believes in heart and confesses with their mouth will be saved. You know what? That verse was actually not, wasn't originally given to us. It was originally given to the early church, the Christian church. Back then, if you confessed, that meant you're going to be thrown into the den of lions. Back then, if you confess, you're going to be beheaded. Back then, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you decide to say, you know what, I am the follower of Jesus Christ, back then, you're probably martyred. So 2,000 years ago, when people, when people said, I, I believe in Jesus, you know what that meant? I give up my life. If you believe like that, and if you confess like that, you will be saved. But Bible never says, the Bible never says, you know what? Just repeat after me, after this prayer, and then you will be saved. It's a spell. You know, it's a surprising spell. And if you repeat after me, if you die, you know, you're going to, be, you're going to go to heaven. It's a, it's a heavenly insurance. The Bible never says that. We have a wrong notion of what, what it means to live as a Christian in North America. Guys, I want you to really wake up to this. What is your definition of Christianity? Coming to church on Friday after, youth, uh, after school. You know, Friday, school's out. You know, maybe you've got to do something on Saturday, but, you know, Friday you have nothing to do. So you come to hang out with your youth group buddies, you know. And after, you know, you're Chondosanim talking for about uh, 30 minutes and going to that little prayer and you play you know, little games and pray songs. After that, after you're done, what do you, do? You, know, you say, oh, hey, let's go eat Chipotle, yo. You go eat Chipotle and you go get some boba drinks. And then you drive around, you know, the highway with your other guys and girls that just got the driver's license in your rice rocket. And on Saturday, you come to church, do car wash and fundraising for the mission trip that you don't even know why we're doing it. And Sunday, you come all tired, 30 minutes into worship. You really don't want to come, but your mom dragged you out of bed. You come on Sunday, you just sit there until Moksanim stops talking about God. You're just falling asleep half the time, playing with your phone, doing cacao talk. And after worship, you eat that cookbook with a 
like adults, you know, soup and rice with kimchi inside. That's a standard thing. And after that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't fulfill you. So you say, hey, let's go to the mall in New York, you know, New Mall. Let's go to the mall. And then you go to the mall, and then you get some donuts and hang out with your friends in the food court, just wasting time for three hours. And let's go catch a movie. You go, go catch a movie. Goodbye, guys. I'll see you next week. You go back home. And by the time you graduate from high school, you go party in your college, and you feel guilty after a freshman year. And what do you do? Well, I'm going to join Campus Crusade for Christ. And you try to redeem yourself for the following three years. You graduate, and you try to get your job, get a job, try to get settled. Now it's time for you to get settled. So what, what do you do? You try to put back on your Christian outfit. You come into church, try to meet up with a Christian sister who can be a good mother to your children. You dream of building up a Christian family with American dream. Beautiful children, beautiful wife. As long as you're a Christian and as long as your family goes to church, you know that your children are not going to go do something really, really bad. It's a guarantee you have. A church. And what do you do? Maybe after you're a certain age, you get promoted to deacon. You get promoted to an elder. And maybe just to escape from the guilty feeling that you're not doing anything for God, maybe you just take a one week off the summer vacation and go to Honduras or Mexico for a summer mission trip. And after that, you know, maybe you're 60, 70 years old, and if you die, you feel better about yourself thinking, you know what, I have insurance in heaven. I'm going, to go to, I'm going to go to heaven because Jesus Christ. If that's what Christianity is, I'm going to renounce my faith. Jesus Christ did not die for us for that kind of life. Do you realize that? I want you to really think about this, guys. I want you to really think about it. Where is your life heading? 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what is your life? What does your life look like? Do you want to live like this? Coming to church, half falling asleep during worship. And you, you, sometimes, sometimes you, you don't even know why you're here. Sometimes you don't even know who you're confessing these confessions to. Sometimes we don't even know why, who, who you're singing these songs to. Nothing touches me. There's no tear-dropping uh, worships. Half the time you feel empty in worship. Christianity just is a dreading experience for a lot of us. Why? Guys, I was like that. About 11 years ago, I was a youth pastor, EM pastor in Chicago. And um, 11 years ago, I was driving uh, the car of my dream. It's not a Ferrari. I can't drive that as a, as a seminarian. I was driving the car of my dream that was affordable, uh, affordable uh, Jeep Wrangler. Hard top. You can take the top down. If you drive Jeep Wrangler in, in summertime on LSC, Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, it's amazing. Wind, boombox, speakers, you're driving, it's amazing. And with, with Jeep Wrangler, there's no obstacles. Huge tires. If somebody cuts in front of you, just follow him to the uh, parking garage of like Barnes & Noble and park on top of him. You know, there's nothing scary. Rains, you're not afraid of rain. If you're, dry, if you're a Jeep, Jeep driver, if, if it rains, those Lexus drivers and Beamer drivers, they put, they close the roof, right? Jeep drivers, you don't do that. We're tough. So we drive, rain comes down, rainstorm. What we do, we keep on driving, but we just bust out our swimming goggles, <laughs> start driving. I love fashion. I love fashion. So I used to shop a lot, especially uh, my favorite store was uh, Banana Republic. I know they're not doing too well these days, but back then, that was the thing. Banana Republic, the BR. I had my personalized BR card, and I go in there, and I don't even have to try it on BR. I'm not made for BR. The BR was made for me. I don't have to try it on. T-shirt, medium. Shirt, medium. Pants, 30 to 32. Jacket. 42 regular, I don't have to try it on. That, that size fit me perfectly. I would go in there, I don't even need a fitting room. If I like it, if I see uh, the outfit the mannequin is wearing, I just tell the employee, I want that. <laughs> I walk out with my BR bag. I was living the life of my dream. 
constant paychecks coming in. I was su surrounded by people who loved me, my church members, brothers and sisters. My, my, uh, my weekly routine looked like what I described to you earlier, going to uh, the mall, going to Panda Express, eating that General Souls chicken and Chipotle and getting that boba drink after Friday night service and shooting some hoops on Sunday afternoon and thinking that's the church, thinking that's what Christianity is all about. But guess what? One day I was going to church. I was getting ready, I opened my closet, and it struck me that day. I looked at my closet, something really interesting happened. You're, I came from a military background, but I am, I, I'm a, I, I organize things very well. Let me put it that way, okay? Don't get freaked out. I, get, I, I love organizing things. It's not too bad. I just put every hanger three fingers apart. It's not too bad. Everything's just color coordinated. From dark color to light color. From dark color to light color, sweaters. Everything's three fingers apart. I opened my closet to go to church to get dressed, and it really struck me that day. I was surprised. You know why? I don't know why it never occurred to me until that day, but that morning I opened my closet and I began to see it. Different colors, but exactly the same clothes. The BR, but gap. They say, you know what, this fall collection is brown. You get everything brown. Brown shirt, brown t-shirt, brown pants. You look like a walking tree. This spring collection is yellow, and you buy, you buy everything yellow, light, light yellow, dark yellow, uh, hot yellow, or whatever that is, yellow. This summer is pink. Pink is the new black. You buy everything pink. I was doing that, right? Every summer, every fall, every uh, winter, I, was, I would change my colors. But that morning, I opened my closet, and it surprised me. You know why? Exactly same clothes, different colors. Banana Republic, Italian Merino sweaters. Exactly same, sometimes you have a pocket, sometimes you have a button. Exactly same color, but uh, exactly same sweater, but different colors. Shirts, just a little different pinstripes, different shirts. Sometimes their color is a little different, but exactly same shirt. Exactly same khakis. I began to realize I, I've been deceived. And I, what really scared me was, if I change my color 10 more times, I'm going to be 40 years old. Another 10 times, I'm going to, I'm going to be 50 years old. Where my, where's my life heading? I was so scared, I stepped back and looked outside the window. My car was parked, my dream car. And until that day, and I, I don't know why it never occurred to me, that car that I was driving around pretending to be my car, that, that wasn't even my car. You know why? I was paying the loan. And until you completely pay off your loan, that car belongs to the bank. 60 payments, five years. Five years of payment, you finally pay it off, and finally you own your car, but guess what? New model comes out. <laughs> Trade it in, get a brand new car. You drive around pretending it to be your car. Everybody looks up to you and say, oh, you're driving a nice car. But you're driving, but guess what? That car actually belongs to the bank. And I began to realize, if you change your car five times, that's 25 years. Why, where is my life heading? Is my life that meaningless? And at that time, I prayed to God, God, I, I, can't, I can't live like this. I can't die like this. I want my life to mean something for your kingdom. I want to live right. I want to, if, if, if I want to do Christianity, if I want to really embrace this faith, I'm going to do it right. Before I realized, I was out in China serving the underground church, living my life for Jesus Christ. So I'm going to challenge you guys. What have you risked to follow after Jesus Christ? He says in Luke chapter 14, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Do you hear that? I'm not going to go around and like sugarcoat this. So let, me, let me say it again. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own mother, father, wife, children, and brother and sister, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Hear that? A lot of atheists say, see, Jesus is actually teaching his disciples to hate his family. But let me tell you, he's not telling you to actively hate your family, but he's saying relatively hate your family. Because your love for God is so great, your biological 
parents, your love for them would look like hate. But God is saying, you know what? I want your love for God is so great. Your dedication for God is so great. Your affection toward God is so great. The most obvious love as human, your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters, I want those kind of affections to look very minor in your life. Do you love God like that? If you don't, live, if you don't love God like that, what, what is he saying? You will not be my disciple. In other words, you cannot be saved. Guys, I want you to really think about this. Do you want to do this? Do you want to go on like this? Ten years from now, you're going to be another burnt out EMer. Well, I come to church for 30 years, 40 years, but I don't feel anything. Where is your life heading, guys? Think about it, guys. I want you to wake up and think about it. Where is your life heading? Do you want to finish like this? Do you want to check out like this? I want this church to go somewhere 10 years from now, 20 years from, 20 years from now. I want you to build up a church that's going to last. All your parents going to retire or slowly fade away. Who's going to take over the church? Who's going to take the initiative? Who's going to take the leadership over the church? I want you to think about your faith, think about your relationship with God, and I want you to reconsider your dedication for the kingdom of God. Number one, the gospel. Number two, the cross. Pick up your cross. Pay the price, the cost of discipleship. Number three, please repeat after me, the promise. Okay, your voice is already, like, fading away. You, you guys were so excited. The gospel! Number two, you don't know exactly what cross was. So like, the cross! But now you guys exactly know what it is, so you're like, the promise. <laughs> I'm not too excited about this sermon. But let me tell you, the promise. Let me read it to you, okay? I'm, I'm going to reread it. So just listen up. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. You know what? Fishers of men. It's really interesting. When Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men, we think, we think, come and follow me. I will immediately change you, change you into super Christians that can save other people. We think this process takes a uh, uh, very short time. But if you look at the Greek original text, the verb tense that's used here is not a simple um, process. The verb tense that's used here uh, is trying to communicate to us it's, like, it's going to be a long process. When, so when Jesus says, you know what, come and follow me, I will make you fishers of men, what he's trying to say is this, I have a long way to the cross. It might be three years from now. But until the cross, I'm going to go through a lot of times. People are going to stone me. There's going to be a restless nights. There's going to be times that you're, going to, you're not going to have a place to rest your head. Sometimes you're going to go hungry. Sometimes you're going to be uh, so thirsty. If you accompany me, there's going to be a lot of experiences you're going to have to go through with me. There are times you're going to be uh, so uh, tempted to go back into the world. There are times that you're going to be so scared that you're going to, be, you're going to betray me and deny me. And because of the denial, you're going to go back into the world and you're going to feel guilty about yourself. But there are times that you're going to have and share that joy of ministry with me. You're going to share that victory with me. You're going to go through a lot of things with me. And throughout these processes, I'm going to make you eventually into the fishers of men. That's the Greek term that's used here. It's not a one-time thing, but Jesus is saying, you know what? It's going to be a long process. I'm going to take time with you, and I'm going to make you eventually, through different processes, I'm going to make you into fishers of men. I guarantee you, I will make you into fishers of men. That's the promise. So let me ask you this question. Why is he taking so long? Why is he making this a big deal? Can, can he just make us into fishers of men? Let me tell you why. Because the notion of ocean back then is so different from what we have today. When we think about the wor word ocean or sea or beach, what do you think? John, what do you think? <laughs> what? Water? Yeah, I know, but... Uh, when you think about uh, ocean, sea, what do you think? Vacation, holiday, surfing, suntan, you know, party. That's what we think. But back then, ocean or sea, where fishermen go, 
That wasn't usually the case. Because back then, um, it was a little different. When fishermen go out to the sea, there was no guarantee they're going to return. That's why in different port cities, there's a lot of different religions and gods, right? Because the families that, that are left behind were always uh, waiting for their uh, loved ones to return to them uh, with anxiety, hoping that they're going to return safely. So the, no, the notion of um, sea or ocean was very different uh, in Jesus' times from, uh, fr from wh wh where we are. Because back then, 2,000 years ago, ocean is a place where dead people go. That's the gateway into Hades. Have you ever seen a movie? So there are so many movies like this. There are scenes where uh, they try to lay that uh, dead body of a person on a raft, and they send them off into the ocean. I'm sure you've seen it, either a cartoon or a movie. You know why? Because they believe, they used to believe, at the end of the ocean, there was a gateway into Hades. So ocean is where dead people go. Ocean is where the power of darkness reigns. Ocean is where um, the darkness resides. When Jesus is saying, you know what? Come and follow me. I'm going to make you into fishers of men. In other words, I'm going to send you into the ocean. There are dying people out there. The world's going to enter into a time of tribulation. It's not going to be an easy time. There's going to be more and more difficult times that's going to come ahead. But in those times, I want you to go into the world, and I want you to save people. That's why I'm going to take time with you. You're going to go through a lot of experiences. There's going to be success and fails. There's going to be times of happiness. There's going to be times that you're going to be crying. There's going to be time of guilt that you have to struggle with. But there are times going to be a time of uh, Forgiveness. You're going to go through these experiences, and eventually, you're going to know who I am. You're going to be, you're going to learn how to walk with me. And after these, I'm going to send you into the ocean to save those dying souls. I'm going to send you into the world. That's the reason why Jesus is saying, I'm going to take, you, I'm going to take time with you. And the promise is, you know what? I will finish the good work that I have started in you. Nothing to fear. I'm the one who's going to be faithful to, to finish that good work. Guys, there's going to be some difficult times that's coming. I want you to wake up to this, all right? There's some difficult times that's, that's waiting for us ahead. Um, the world economy is going down, and you think, oh, it's getting better. But guys, wake up. It's not going to get better. It's temporarily a little, little better. But eventually, the Bible reality is going to take place. What's the Bible, what, does, what does the Bible say? There's going to be a time of famine. There's going to be more wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be more persecutions. You know what Jesus said, actually, uh, towards uh, this generation? He said, you know what? If you try to live a godly life in Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted. In other words, if you're not being persecuted, the, if, if the world loves you, there's going to be something wrong with you. If you really try to live a godly life in Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted. What else does he say? Whoever is persecuted for my name's sake, for the righteousness' sake, theirs is the kingdom of God. And what else does he say? We're heirs of God, co-heirs of Christ. In order to be glorified with him, we will have to suffer with him. He talks about suffering. He talks about the cross. He talks about tribulation. He talks about difficult time. That's the time that Jesus is trying to send us into. He's trying to send us into the world. And many of us are not even ready because we can't even walk straight with our own faith. Well, there's no pastor in my church. Guys, wake up. Let me ask you this. Where is that main fountain of living water that's going to make, that's going to make your soul, uh, soul uh, to quench its thirst? Where is that main source of life in your life? Uh, in, in your life? This is not a rhetorical question, so I want you to answer. John, wake up. It's not a rhetorical question, so I want you to really answer my question. What, where, is, where is the source of life in your life? Where is a source of uh, your spiritual nutrition? Let me tell you, that source of life 
the fountain of living water does not belong to your pastor, does not belong to your church, does not belong to your EM pastor, does not belong to anyone. Jesus actually said, I am the living water. And when you say, Jesus, I open up my heart and I want, you, I want to accept you into my heart, would you come into my heart? Do you remember praying that? That moment, the living water himself came into our hearts. The problem is we have no idea how to draw water from within to survive in this day and age. That's why we complain, oh, pastor's gone. I can't even live. How come there's no church? There's only six people in my EM. You know what that means? I've been relying on my EM. I've been relying on my EM pastor too. Give me water. It's like you're holding a cup. Every Sunday you go to church. Pastor, give me water. And pastor pours a little water through his sermon. And he brings this, thank you, and you go back home. You drink all that water. The following week, you go back to church and say, pastor, give me more water. You get that water, you go back home, and you drink that water. And the following week, you go back to church and say, pastor, would you, would you give me more water? But guess what? Pastor's gone. There's no one to provide that water in your life. That's a church. That's a problem with the immigrant church. Where do I get this water from? Where do I, where do I get this water from? First week, it's okay. First month, it's okay. But as time goes by, you're going to dry up. But I'm going to remind you, the living water does not belong to your Ian pastor. The living water does not belong to the church that might break or live. The living water, it's in you. I, I'm working in China, and I uh, used to do heavy uh, ministry with North Koreans. Uh, I used to work with uh, the Chinese people that deliver the gospel, uh, into, uh, take the gospel into North Korea. But there was an elder that I used to work with. It's a, he's a very interesting guy. The way he uh, sh uh, shares the gospel, takes the gospel into, the, into, into North Korea. Yeah, he's a Chinese guy. But what he does is um, he actually enters into uh, North Korea, and he owns a convenience store in North Korea. Can you believe that? He actually owns a convenience store in North Korea. And whenever he opens his shop, all the customers, he shares the gospel. And after work, he shuts the shutter, and he takes his car, uh, his, his, his cart, he walks back into China side and sleeps. And next morning, he wakes up, he takes the cart back into North Korea, he opens the shutter, and he, uh, he opens the store. So he goes back and forth between North Korea and China uh, to share the gospel. But one day, he got arrested at the, bo at the border. He was sent into, the Chinese, uh, into North Korean prison for sharing the gospel. But for him, it was an opportunity for him to share more gospel to more North Koreans. So uh, uh, original, um, in the beginning, they actually placed him with other uh, cellmates. But for him, it was, it's, it was an opportunity for him to do missions. So he was sharing the gospel to other people in, North Korea, uh, in, in that cell. So that um, the prison guards were just so uh, worried about what's going to happen. So what, what, what ended up happen, happening was um, they took him out of that cell and they put, placed him into a solitary, single room. But we, don't, we think of a single room, we think, oh, that's a not, it must be nice. But let me tell you, it's North Korea, and you know what that room looks like? He described to me later, and that room looks, looks like this. One meter by one meter by one meter. It's a box. You're sitting in there, there's no, no light coming in. You're just sitting in there, you're just, you, you're just uh, squatting. You know how long he stayed? I can't, re I can't recall exactly how long he stayed, but I remember I think it was about three months. He was squatting inside the box for three months. And I heard later, even if you're like special force, no one can survive in that box, isolated little box for more than 48 hours, tops. You're going to go insane because you're not seeing lights. One Sunday, they open a little hole, they throw him a little, little bun. He eats waste, eats waste inside a little box. If it's a normal person, yeah, you can stay there for about 48 hours, and you're going to go insane after that. You're not talking to anyone. You're just stay, staying by yourself. But he, that man stayed there for three months. After coming out of the bus, box, they interrogated him. Who did you, you share the gospel to? How did you share it? What was the purpose of your shop? For two months, and... The final, final month, they made him write down everything that he, 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 he answered during that interrogation. So altogether, he stayed there for about six months, and he was released back into China. 
And after he was being released, uh, I had a chance to meet him. I had an honor to meet him. So I asked him, sir, how did you survive? That was my burning question in my heart. So how did you survive? Because no one survives that little box for more than 48 hours, but he survived for three months, and he's totally fine. So I asked him, sir, how did you survive? You know what he said? There's a Chinese, the proverb saying way, you know, he, the Chinese people, the master way of saying things. He had a huge grin on his face, and I said, sir, how did you survive? And he, asked, he, he, he acted like he's Jedi or something. It's like, I was drinking. I'm sorry, I sounded like Russian. I was drinking. <laughs> the apple juice. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> so how did you survive? He said, I was drinking. And I said, drinking what? You know what he said? I was drinking for three months from the living water. And I was like, what? And he says, brother, do you know where the, where the fountain of the living water is? I said, in us? And this is what he said. Yes, the fountain of living water does not belong outside the box, does not belong inside the church, but belong, belongs within me. So as long as Jesus is with me, as long as I, there is a living water in me, What's the difference? Outside the box, inside the box, what's the difference? For three months, I was communicating with him. I was having fellowship with him. I was praying to him. I was worshiping him. He survived. You, you think your situation is bad? You think New York situation is bad? You think Korean American churches are bad? I don't think so. People survive. The real question is, is there the fountain of living water in me or not? He said, if, you, if I'm in you, I'll never abandon you. There's nothing that's going to be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Time has come. So lastly, wrap it up. Number four, please repeat after me. The example. So we examined three things already. Number one, the gospel. Number two, the cross. Number three, the promise. But the last element of the calling is the example. Many of us, up to this point, we think, you know what, this is such an unbearable calling. This is so impossible. Oh, carrying the cross, oh, man, I don't think I can do it. But you know what? I'm going to remind you, there's an element of the, exa the example at the end of the story. Jesus, when, sa when Jesus says, come and follow me, I want you to really, really be reminded of this. When he says, follow me, there is something that he wanted to communicate to us. You know what that is? When he said, follow me, that means I am the example. When he says, follow me, he says, let me go first. When he says, follow me, look how I do it. When Jesus says, follow me, he meant, this is how you carry the cross. He carried the cross. He says, follow me, this is how you die. He died of death. When Jesus says, follow me, this is how you submit to your father. He submitted to the father to the point of death. When Jesus says, follow me, this is how you keep your faith in the father so that he's going to raise me from the dead. He placed his trust in the father, and the father was faithful to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, look at me. I am the example. Do you realize that Jesus Christ will never ask you to do anything unless he has done himself? Don't be afraid. That's the calling that God is giving us. And if you would, if you would only respond, your lives can be transformed. You're going to be able to really ra be, be able to rise up as Christians and live this life to mean something for the kingdom of God.